Welcome to this chess course. First off, I want to congratulate you on getting the course. I think it's a great idea. Chess is pretty much the richest game out there, and it really has this, this appeal that's so hard to understand. I mean, Howard Stern, Bill Gates, Martin Shkreli, Clay Thompson, Priest Holmes, the Klitschko brothers, medical doctors, lawyers, I, I see them all playing chess. And, you know, one of the things that I've heard personally from medical doctors is that they want to create those masterpieces. It's just the ultimate mind game, even if you have, you know, a really taxing, high service job. There's just something really special about chess, something really beautiful about chess, and something really intellectual about chess. It's just such a challenging game. So just want to congratulate you on actually getting this course. And I think really only a few hours of knowledge is necessary to be able to beat probably 99% of the people that you'll ever play. So it's nice to be able to beat people you know, like people at work, your friends, anybody, in a game of chess. And it's something that comes up surprisingly often. You go out to a bar, there's a chess set there. You go to a little party, someone whips out a chess set. See it happen all the time. So, very good choice on, on getting this course. I'm international master Eric Kislik, and I myself got into chess because I played in a tournament when I was 13 and I was just hypnotized by the game. I, I just realized, wow, this game is really, really deep, and I just love the strategy behind it. And when I, when I really got into the strategy of chess, I started to think, wow, this has so many parallels to life. So many things like slowly building up your position, having no weaknesses, and just kind of, kind of building yourself up throughout life is a lot like what people do in a chess game. They kind of build up small advantages. They bring their pieces into the game, and then they finally launch an attack, usually. Not always, of course. But... This is a common way that a game develops, even at pro level, or especially at pro level, I should say. So, first of all, I want to say that the goal of chess is checkmating the king. So, sometimes you can checkmate the king very early on in the game, and that's why it's very good to be aware of all of the straightforward, simple checkmates. All of the basic checkmates, I think, should be known and can be learned very quickly. So, my recommendation is to watch all of the basic checkmates watch them two, three, four times, make sure you know those, and I think you can get them down pretty quickly. So just to sum up, um, one of the ideas, one of the basic ideas, is that we're trying to checkmate the opponent's king. And there are a couple cases where we can checkmate the king where it will be trapped. So essentially on the back, so in, in chess, there are ranks and there are files. and so files go from, go from A to H, and, and uh, ranks go from 1 to 8. And when the king has, has all of its pawns, I'll, I'll show you some examples of this later, but basically when a king cannot move anywhere and is checked on the back rank with nothing to block with, then it's a, it's a back rank checkmate. And when you see a bunch of examples of, of this type of checkmate, it starts to become very simple to see. And I noticed that there are other checkmates on the side of the board that a lot of people just wouldn't consider, but it's the same idea. And the basic name of it is called the corridor mate. So it's kind of like you trapped somebody in a corridor and then they're done. So, you know, a lot of these things in chess are related to king safety because the goal of the game is checkmate. And if you're not able to checkmate the king, what you want to do after that, well, instead, I should say, to try to increase your chances of checkmating the king, two main goals. One is to try to win material that your opponent has. And if you win enough material, you'll just totally outnumber their army and be able to take lots of their pieces. Additionally, being able to queen a pawn, promote one of your pawns, is very, very important. I'll be talking about the pieces shortly after this. And Another thing that's very important to realize in chess is that weakness is the basis for all tactics. So without any, anything actually weak in the opponent's position, it's very hard to land a deathly blow. Whereas, you know, for instance, with something like fighting, it's very different because the human chin is quite weak. And if you take a hard shot, pretty much anybody can be done. So, you know, in chess, it's a little bit different. Inherently, positions are very solid 
if one side makes no mistake makes no mistakes puts all their pieces on pretty good squares puts their king away into a safe place so all of these things are very important to to think about and one thing that I want to say is that uh, it's it's always been so amazing to me how the combative nature of chess really it, it really brings out so many interesting personalities and really excites so many players and it's just the, the depth of the game, the amount of ideas and conceptions. It's uh, it's really such a warlike game, and because because of how warlike the game is, you know, you're kind of like at the head of the chain of command. Um, I think it's actually very interesting to think about chess strategy in terms of war strategy. So I want to start off and discuss some typical kind of war strategies, and then we'll see how they apply to chess. So that you know you can kind of conceptualize some of the some of the strategies and what you might try to do because there's a pretty heavy overlap and it's actually very interesting when you factor all of that in. So you know ultimately, um, you, usually during wartime, the the main three goals um, of either side in general, the first one is to conquer and destroy the enemy. In chess, that's not necessarily to capture all their pieces, it's to checkmate their king. And of course, capturing the main body of the enemy army is often very useful, of course. Um, taking possession of their material is very important as well. And occupying the opponent's capital, well, for instance, in, in war. Um, but in, in chess, what that would mean is taking control of the center or taking control of the opponent's seventh rank very close to their king. And so essentially what a lot of people do who are starting out in chess is they'll put a lot of their pieces on the side of the board and they won't focus so much on the center. But the problem there is it's a little bit like let's say you're, you know, let's say you're trapped in a closet. It's kind of like that where, you know, let's say you're you're in an apartment and somebody breaks into your apartment and you know, if you get trapped in trapped in the closet, you can't escape. Let's say you're in the in the main living room and you have two or three doors out. You might have three different options to get out, and that's the mobility factor. So it sounds like a strange analogy, you know, a home invasion, but that's actually a pretty good one in chess. So um, if you're only playing on the side of the board and just kind of touching everything on the side and not paying attention to the center. If they're playing in the center, they're going to be controlling a lot more squares. So that's a very important one as well. So um, in chess, you know, if you can win the opponent's material, win it. If you can occupy the center or put your rooks on the seventh rank, um, all of those things. Yes, of course we want to do those things. And um, if we can, if we can conquer and destroy the enemy, of course we want to do that. Um, another thing that I want to talk about are more general strategies more general war principles and strategies. And one of them is using your entire force with the utmost energy. In other words, don't waste time. And in chess, this is very important as well. One thing you may notice is that when a lot of people start playing, one of the first things they do is start moving the queen around. I have my queen here. Oops. They start moving the queen around and they might move it one, two, three, four, five times in a row. But the problem is, if you're only playing with one piece, it's not going to be very effective. And you won't be playing with the utmost energy. And to really get the most energy out of your pieces, you have to have as many forces as possible participating. So that's a very important thing to think about. Another, another um, strategy is concentrating on the main point. And that's a very common thing, if, let's say, if you're playing for checkmate. You're, you're thinking about, all right, well, where could I possibly checkmate them? What is weak? And you look for a way to take advantage of that. Another one is basically optimal utilization of force. And in other words, concentration of force. This is exactly what I was talking about, where if you play with your queen too much and, and don't focus on, on using some of your other pieces, you know, if you don't bring your other pieces into the game, um, there can easily be a problem because the thing is you won't have enough concentration of force. Imagine your opponent has four pieces in play and you only have one in play. 
those four pieces will easily be able to cover an attacked square, whereas the one piece attacking probably won't be able to do much damage. It, it'll basically be a one-man mission when you could have a five or six-man mission. So it's important to make sure that you have all of those pieces in play whenever possible. And I'm gonna show plenty of examples of this. And another, another important thing is economy of effort. So, you know, that, that basically means the resources, tools, weapons you have available, and you, you go, you're going to wanna to be as economical as possible. So let's say you wanna defend your king. What you might wanna do is if you can use one or two pieces to defend almost all the key squares in, in, next to your king, that is a great use of economy of force because you're using minimal, minimal force, the minimal amount of pieces to defend a lot of space. Likewise, if you can attack the same way, if you can attack, let's say with three pieces, that's a very valuable thing to do as well. So another strategy I wanna mention is flexibility. And flexibility, I mean, the analogy that I talked about with the home invasion, that's actually a pretty good one when it comes to flexibility. So if we're, if we're totally controlling the center, we can easily move from side to side. I can easily go over here or over here. I can easily go down here or back here. So if they're only controlling a small amount of space, um, they can't really move very well. So that's a really important thing to think about. So flexibility is, is really important because not only does it give you the possibility to overstretch the defensive side, but also allows you to just generally change course. So whether you're attacking or defending, you can easily kind of juke your way out of things, go from side to side. You can go wherever you need to go. So flexibility is an important thing. And also, of course, like I was tying this into, um, cooperation is very important, cooperation between your pieces. And I, I can totally remember when I was just starting out in chess, and I would always try these attacks with one piece, two pieces in play. And I would have these pieces just sitting in the corner, not participating at all. And it's basically like, imagine that you're the CEO of a company. You're running this company and, or let's say you're, you're running a restaurant or something. And you have a couple, of, a couple of your workers who just like to hang out in the fridge and just kind of hang out, you know, play on their cell phones. They're not doing any work. And you're like, hey guys, get back to work. That's exactly the problem if you have inactive pieces that are not doing anything. So I'll show you some examples of pieces that are out of play, not doing anything, and the importance of bringing them into play. So if there's not a lot of action going on, if there are no direct threats, there's nothing kind of exploding, nothing, nothing that exciting going on, a, a very useful strategy is just to improve your worst place piece. If you have a piece that's badly placed, you wanna bring it in and we wanna develop our forces. We want everything to come into the game. So we want everything to come into the game as quickly as possible and as energetically as possible because like I said before, we don't wanna waste time. So another thing is that security is very, very important. And what, that, what I mean by that is I mean security for your king. And that is exactly why early in the game, usually, not always, but usually one side, one side will put their king in the corner. And the whole point is that you put your king in the corner of the board and if the king is in the corner, then it's gonna be much harder to attack and much easier to protect because from the corner, it can't be attacked as easily on both sides. It can only be attacked on one side. And that's a very important point. But I do wanna mention that sometimes the king is safe in the center. There are two main cases where the king would be safe in the center. The first one where it's safe in the center is when the center is completely closed. There are no open files. When there are no open files, then that's a typical case where you can just keep everything closed, no problem, your king cannot be attacked. Another one is when enough pieces have been traded off that your king is no longer a target. And I do wanna mention that the king can be a very useful piece in any kind of end game. It, it can actually be quite, a, quite an active attacking piece. So in some cases we can use the king as an attacker and in other cases, the king can itself run away from an attack. So if we can run away from a dangerous battlefield and run to a safer quadrant or section, then that, that can very often be a good strategy itself. So it is important to realize that the king has flexibility itself, but we do need to be careful because if the king has no actual pawn cover, we can easily be in some danger.